you can build your business in a way that runway isn't an issue. And, and here's what I mean by that. So when we built Price Intelligently, and that was the that was originally our name and our first product. And it was a pure software product. A lot of people don't know that. And we, we started selling it and it just wasn't working. Uh, people were buying it, they were getting value. The churn was really bad. Then we had people who just weren't getting the value and didn't understand it. And there's just a whole host of like classic problems. Now, let's say we were very, very convinced that that was the world that we were gonna live in. We didn't raise any money. We're still completely bootstrapped and we're about 50 people, 10 million in revenue. That's kind of our, our back of the baseball card, you know, facts. But what we did is we found that if we went up market, all of a sudden we could start to feed the beast and actually grow a company going up market, not quite into the enterprise, but kind of into the mid market. And then from there, what it allowed us to do is basically fund the down market product that we were able to spend you know, over a year on, and that was profitable well metrics, without charging anyone because we found out early on that charging for people for that just wasn't gonna be a great business. If you have a subscription model type of business, this is the episode that you want to listen to. I'm interviewing Patrick Campbell. He's the CEO and founder of ProfitWell, and he is the thought leader, the person that people go to in the subscription model industry when they want to get clean, accurate data and they want to be able to understand it so that they can create an overall lift in their business so that they can reduce churn and increase the value of their customers. Let me give you a quick background of what you're going to get in this episode. First, you're going to understand when it makes sense for you to raise capital for your business and when it doesn't. You're going to be able to understand what makes data so hard to believe and how to pull your ego out of that equation. And I use the word equation because Patrick has this math and econometrics background. He previously worked at Google. He's led this company to a significant revenue level. And he's also going to be talking about what it takes for you as a business owner to move the needle so that you can cross that million dollar threshold and go beyond if that's something you want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out jumping into the interview. He's going to give us a quick background of what he's done and what he's doing. And we're getting into the meat of the conversation. My background's in econometrics and math. Um, you know, I went to school in Illinois. I'm from a small town in Wisconsin. Moved out to Boston to work at Google. And then about six years ago, jumped into the fray here and started ProfitWell. We used to be called Price Intelligently, but I'm the CEO and founder here. And basically what we do is we build products that help specifically subscription companies, not just subscription software, but all types of different subscription companies, not only with their metrics. Uh, we have a free metrics tool that they can use to get their churn and MRR and all of the fun actual reporting. But then we also have products that we sell that help with churn and help with pricing and a couple of other pieces. Let's talk about that. I, obviously coming from Google, um, and from a math background, um, that is something that is uh, totally needed in understanding um, metrics like to deep levels. And so when you're running your company, first let's, let's zoom all the way out. What are, the, what are the core KPIs that you're looking at on your business? And then what are the core KPIs that you're telling business owners to look at in the subscription model? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the core KPI is it's 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 more around growth than it is anything. So that that's really what you're in the business of doing is growing, right? You're you're it doesn't have to be aggressive growth, it doesn't have to be crazy growth, but it it does need to be growth in some manner and so all KPIs, they they have some level, at least in my opinion, of, hey, this is where it is and this is where we're trying to go. Uh, from from an actual subscription standpoint, monthly recurring revenue is obviously pretty big. But then that breakdown of your expansion revenue, your contraction revenue, your churn, all of those become pretty important because the nature of metrics and, and the nature of just data in general is that it's it's not about necessarily one number. It's about, okay, that number is not going in the right direction. What is that number made up of? Oh, it's made up of these other numbers. Which ones can I influence? Oh, I'm going to go try to influence that one, which will hopefully help that that top level number. And so... Yeah, there's not like an exact core. It's a little bit different for every single business, but it's probably some function of, of growth. And are you able to look at it and, and see an overall lift um, and quantitatively be able to say, okay, what we did over here actually affected something that we wouldn't expect? Is, do you have opportunities like that often? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the nature of, and, and that's frankly, that's why we built ProfitWell is because, you know, we want to be able to keep track of, of our business. Uh, and so the ProfitWell metrics piece, and, and this is also a reason we give it away for free is because it's one of those things where, you know, we want people to be able to understand their metrics and not have the big barrier be, hey, I just need to understand where this is. The barrier should be, hey, I need to move this number. Let me figure out how to move it. And so, yeah, there's plenty of, you know, fun examples of, you know, hey, there's this number and we're going to do everything in our power to go after this number. And, you know, we're going to run a bunch of experiments and then we're going to see, did it move that number? Did it not move that number? And what's kind of funny, and this is getting maybe down a path that you don't want to go down, but what's kind of funny is that um, oftentimes you can't move like the top level number like MRR, like we can do a lot of things that are going to adjust your monthly recurring revenue. But in reality, what you kind of want to focus on is a lot more of what goes into that number. Because if you start to explore what goes into your monthly recurring revenue, well, it's a function of upgrades, downgrades, churn, like I already stated. And because of that, I might be able to influence one of those a little bit better, which there will therein will help the monthly recurring revenue. And so, yeah, that's it's a big thing when it comes to metrics. And a lot of people, they just kind of focus a little bit too much just on the nature of reporting and not enough on what the reporting is supposed to be doing, which is exactly what you said, helping you move that particular needle in one direction or another. Up next, Patrick explains how to understand your core audience and what you can do to move that user through a nurturing cycle so it benefits both you and the user. And he also talks about why companies don't break through the million dollar growth mark and where your focus should be if you're stuck in that phase. The nature of having a free product is there's tons of different types of businesses who use it. So the the core customer is not always who we might have the most of, if that makes sense. And so uh, we we have about, it depends on how you measure it, but uh, in, in certain measurements, we have about 25% of the entire subscription market using ProfitWell. So that includes uh, media companies, that includes um, you know traditional SaaS uh, software, B2B companies, and it even includes a lot of box of the month clubs. And I think what's really interesting for us is that this this is a, a little bit of a, a, a forcing function because the reason we're giving it away for free is, is not because we necessarily want to go after small customers, but it's because we actually want those small customers to be nurtured until they get bigger or to provide us some value and then we can provide some value back in a non kind of commercial sense. And so our target customers tend to be businesses that are a much larger. So with our price intelligently product, which is a, a piece of pricing software that helps businesses, subscription businesses get their pricing right, we are targeting either someone who's between kind of three and $20 million in, in annual revenue, and then someone else who's probably averaging about 75 to $100 million in revenue. And then with our retained products, we're typically focused on those similar personas as well. And so uh, those folks aren't necessarily the ones who are always going to be using the free product, although we have plenty of them who are. Uh, but that's kind of who we, who we target. And then if we go into kind of a role base on, on that question, it depends on the product. So with ProfitWell Metrics, the free product, it's, it's a whole host of different types of personas. You know, you have finance, you have sales, you have marketing, you have product. There's a whole ton of different types of people using it. But then if we go into, you know, stuff like um, retain, that's typically going to be customer success or product. And so this is kind of an interesting problem that we have as a business because we're multi-product so early in our life cycle. And it's, it's a good forcing function for understanding the customer and focusing on the customer um, because you have to have that discipline in order to, to not go all over the place. Mm -hmm. Do you find that a lot of the, maybe we call it like subscription boxes or um, maybe some of the entrepreneurs are just getting started out that they never actually break through, um, through that 3 million mark. And I I would imagine that's the vast majority of them. And if that's the case, then are there metrics or things that you see commonalities of why they're not breaking through going from, you know, uh, crossing the hurdle from like 1 million over to 3 million? Uh, there's things that you've noticed as a pattern? Yeah, I think the, the the biggest threshold is getting to a million, I would argue. Once you get to a million, getting to 3 million or 10 million, which is kind of the next major milestone, it's not, it's not super, it's difficult. Like all, any growth is difficult, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not as hard of going from zero to one. And, and the reason is, is because theoretically, if you've picked some sort of 
business that has a, a good addressable market. Now, there are businesses that get started that don't have a great addressable market. And that honestly, we were one of them. And that's why we pivoted to being multi-product very early on. But it was one of those things where I think that a lot of businesses, when they aren't a multi-product and they're trying to, and they have good TAM, uh, it's, it's okay because all of a sudden the growth might not be exponential, but it's at least going to come because they figured out some semblance of product market fit. Now, the people who don't break through, they don't get from one to three or from zero to three, there's typically some fundamental problem with the actual product around churn. And this is why when, when we build product and really when some of our mentors build product, we don't really go for growth right away. We're really trying to get enough people in that product until we figure out that product is being used or is providing value with 0% churn or as close to 0% churn as, as possible. And the reason is, is because a lot of those companies that can't get from one to three or can't get from one to 10, there's a fundamental problem with that market or the product that they're offering. And every time they're adding customers, there's just too many of them leaving and it's basically causes that stagnant growth. And so when it comes to a numbers perspective, there's, there's plenty of like little specific ones like delinquencies and things like that. But normally the biggest reason you can't get from one to three is, is a lot more around uh, your retention being terrible than, than any other measure of, of kind of acquisition or other types of growth. Okay. So if you're, if you're kind of foregoing the focus on growth and you're really focusing on um, churn and just reducing churn, uh, wouldn't that also mean that you or the business owner should have a lot of runway to be able to have the flexibility to do that? Because oftentimes um, that's why they uh, are out. That's why the business is gone is they just don't have any runway left. Yeah, I think that's true. But I, I think you can you can build your business in a way that runway isn't an issue. And, and here's what I mean by that. So when we built Price Intelligently, and that was, the, that was originally our name and our first product. And it was a pure software product. A lot of people don't know that. And we, we started selling it and it just wasn't working. Uh, people were buying it. They were getting value. The churn was really bad. Then we had people who just weren't getting the value and didn't understand it. And there's just a whole host of like classic problems. Now, let's say we were very, very convinced that that was the world that we were going to live in. We didn't raise any money. We're still completely bootstrapped and we're about 50 people, 10 million in revenue. That's kind of our, our back of the baseball card, you know, facts. But what we did is we found that if we went up market, all of a sudden we could start to feed the beast and actually grow a company going up market, not quite into the enterprise, but kind of into the mid market. And then from there, what it allowed us to do is basically fund the down market product that we were able to spend, you know, over a year on and that was profitable metrics without charging anyone because we found out early on that charging for people for that just wasn't going to be a great business. And so that's an example or an anecdote from us, but there's plenty of other ways you can do this. You're, you're going to build a little bit slower but it's one of those things where you're going to have to raise money. But a lot of times people do run out of money, but it's, it's not because uh, they, um, they had something and just, oh, something went wrong. Normally what ends up happening is they just weren't really thinking through the customer, thinking through growth or thinking through the product in the right way. And ironically, they were going too fast um, and not slow enough to realize they needed to make some pivots or some, some adjustments to be successful. So did you not go after enterprise because of the life cycle or because of, uh, you know, the complexity of making decisions or what were the reasons for going mid market versus enterprise? Uh, I, I mean, I can post hoc rationalize why we did it. I think it was just because that's where the market was taking us. So our, the nature of our business is we had a bunch of folks that were just like, Hey, I don't want to do the work to get the data using your software. And also, even if I get the data, I don't really understand what I'm doing with it. Can you help me? And obviously they didn't say it that bluntly, but after some customer development conversations, that's really what came out of it. And the, the resultant or the result of that was basically we, we went up market and we said, okay, if you pay us, we'll do it. And people are like, okay, and the, they ended up paying us a lot more than uh, we thought they were going to. And our first prices, like our prices now, you know, we were a subscription model on that product and it's probably, I mean, between 15 and 25 grand a month. Um, and you have to sign an annual contract, but it started off. I mean, we, we did our, our first customer for that product was like 1600 bucks. Um, <laughs> and obviously the product has changed dramatically since those early days, but it was one of those things where it, 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 it just, it was, it was an act of will, if, if, if that makes sense. It was just, we just went out and did it. 
And there's a lot of people who go, oh, well, that's going to change, you know, the DNA and you're going to focus on the wrong thing and you're not going to have enough time. And it was like, what are you talking about? We're getting paid to do our customer development. Yes, it's not a giving us 100% of our time to develop the product because now we have customers and we have all this stuff going on. But even if we're spending 50% of our time developing the product in the market and kind of the growth engine, it's going to take us double the time, but we're going to learn so much more that when we catch up to that person who might have raised money and only took them half the time, we're going to be in such a better place than they are uh, because we've learned so much at that point. Absolutely. You make a, you, you, there's a lot of nuggets in there. So hopefully our listeners hit that uh, back button a couple of times is really good. <laughs> Um, no, I, you were talking about the um, being self-funded and maybe it grew a little slower, but it left money on the table for you to actually make some decisions. Um, was that a conscious decision so that you didn't have to go to, you know, uh, venture capitalists or whatever and have them dictate how you guys wanted to move forward? Yeah, I think the cool answer is, is yes, we made this conscious <laughs> choice and FVCs and all that kind of stuff. But I, I don't think, I mean... Venture funding is a tool, right? So if I was starting a subscription box of the month club for dogs like BarkBox, right? There's so much overhead there and you're, you're not going to be able to charge an enterprise or mid-market level of money for a dog box of the month club. So you need to raise money, right? And, and yes, maybe you can bootstrap it out of your kitchen and you, know, you can build up a base, but there's just a point where capital is just so good. And in that scenario, and and we just were very very fortunate that we didn't need to. And and frankly, there was a bit of a naivete, as they say. Um, I I'm a first time founder. I'd never raised cash. I was at a company prior to this, in between Google and Profitwell, that you know had raised a lot of money. And yeah, I I, I was kind of a little bit of disenchanted because you know that board and, and a couple of the members of that board, the the VC side of it, just weren't great. And so, or at least that was the impression. I wasn't even in those rooms, but. So I was kind of like, ah, this doesn't really, I don't want to waste my time going after the VC route because I want to focus in on the customer and figure out if there's something there. And I was also very fortunate, you know, even though this was my mid twenties, I had a 401k that I cashed in from, from Google. It wasn't that much money, but it was enough to, to live extremely poorly for like six to nine months. So I basically said, if I can't figure something out within six to nine months, either raising money or, you know, some sort of model where I can pay myself a little bit then I can always go back and get a job somewhere, even if it means I'm, you know, at Starbucks or something like that, slinging, you know, lattes. I know I can figure out how to get a job. With Patrick's econometrics background, he sees patterns and formulas that many of us don't often catch. Coming up, he explains why the success of a business is a big math formula with the variable of the human ego getting in the way, preventing us to see or admit the problems around us. Yeah, I think it, the first piece of advice is really to understand what you want out of it. If you're making 200 grand a year, 500 grand a year off your business and you just want to, it's just you, that's great, right? Like sometimes I envy those people. Uh, <laughs> You know, because they don't have to work. They don't have to, I mean, they do have to work, but they don't have to work extremely, you know, 40 hours a week necessarily. They've built a really good sustainable business. I, I think that for those people who want to build something big over a million dollars, et cetera, um, you know, and they're not quite getting there. I think that the big thing you have to do is take a step back and really, really evaluate why that's happening. So, it's a function, like it's a giant math formula. That's what a business really is. Uh, and, and there's math formulas on math formulas on math formulas when it comes to a business. And so when I look at a business and I, I, you know, I see into a lot of you know, those, the customers that we help, a lot of times the ones that are struggling, it, it really comes down to some problem with not admitting that there's a problem, not admitting that the problem is bigger than you think it is, or just you know, having the ego that you think the problem is going to go away. And that could be your churn, that could be your growth, that could be the VP of sales is not as good as you think they are. It could be a whole host of things. And normally when you're, you're not able to get over that threshold, there, there's some level of ego that's holding you back. And if you just kind of defer to data and, and that math formula, normally you can kind of fix, fix the problem pretty quickly. Um, I'll give you an example. So there, there's a business that I've, I know I haven't worked with. I'm not a customer or they're, they're not a customer of ours, but they're just 
you know, friends of ours and I, uh, I just know about their business and it's, it's the wrong product for the market. You know, we've talked about this a number of times and he is just going all in continually on this product for the market. He thinks the market's going to catch up and sometimes the market's not going to catch up. And so the conversations I have with him are typically around, Hey, you know, you should really be building this other product in this market. And thankfully you have all these customers, you should just go all in on it. And there's that ego that, you know, he just doesn't want to do that. And so, yep, obviously like I might be wrong too. I'm not saying that I know, but most of the data, if you really are dispassionate about it, indicates that there's a problem there and that he needs to pivot and the ego is just getting in the way. Mm, that's important. That's it's kind of crazy because um, you let out this last piece where you're talking about uh, business is a, a giant math formula. Um, however, the ego is a, a psychological problem. It's not a math problem for the most part. So I, I guess you really have to get both of those worlds to match up well. Yeah, I think of it a little differently. I, I, and it's mainly because of my math and econ background. I think the the ego, it it's it, one, it is a part of the math formula if you really think about it, but I think it clouds your ability to look at the math. So if if I really believe for some reason that this market is going to grow. Let's talk about subscriptions, right? So our business, we are going after high LTV and high ARPU, average revenue per user and lifetime value for, for those of you who aren't um, initiated in, in those types of metrics. And the reason we're doing that is because we've looked at the math and we've, we've said, listen, subscription businesses, there's not going to be a lot of logos. And the logos in this market, meaning the number of companies in this market is not growing exponentially, but the revenue in this market is growing exponentially. So when we looked at ProfitWell and we were going to actually charge for it initially, we did some basic price testing. We did some basic customer research and we discovered, oh crap, the willingness to pay is really low and there's not that many logos in this market. The number of logos aren't, aren't going to continue to go up. And so we looked at it and we could have you know, ignored that data. We could have not even collected that data and just started building for the subscription market. But instead we looked at it and we said, okay, our ego doesn't matter here. What do the numbers actually say? Well, the numbers say that we either have to kill this product that we love and we really want it for ourselves, or we have to, to really kind of figure out how we can build you know, higher LTV, higher ARPU products around this product and use this product for strength. And so that's, that's where the ego, I think, gets in because I've, I've been in plenty of subscription and SaaS boardrooms through my work at Price Intelligently. And to be really frank, like there are CEOs where you show them every single piece of data from multiple different angles. The team's been trying to get the CEO to see the data for six months and he or she is still looking at the data and like, nope, that's, I don't believe it. And it's like, come on, you know, right? That's, that's ego at that point. Wow, that's just sabotage. Um, I think that's a critical, valuable lesson there. If you're in, if you're in the world of startups or, or SaaS or growth or something like that, some of that ego and that cockiness has gotten you to the, where you are today. And so it's really, really hard. It's this weird precipice where you have to sit there and you have to you know, somehow have the belief and have the hustle and the, basically the, the cogs to say, okay, I know this, is, this isn't working. I know this isn't great, but we're going to figure it out while also having the ego to go, okay, I, I, that motivation is really important for direction, but it's not necessarily important for dispassionately looking at a problem and understanding what's the solution's really going to look like. You know, hearing this from a math guy is actually a totally different perspective from when we hear the same, we'll call it the same principle, the same concepts from a business person or a salesperson, because they're typically talking about the psychology and they're talking about the emotion or whatever it could be. But hearing it from the math perspective is actually, it's really enlightening for me um, because it's more or less a formula. Well, emotion, it, it, it's more systems, right? So emotion, I, I, I don't know. I shouldn't speak out of turn, but I'm going to. Uh, but it's, it's more around it. A lot of times that when we talk about psychology and we talk about emotion, it's, it's not wrong. It's just, that's what you're trying to grapple with to kind of explain the phenomenon of what's going on but it's really hard for me to go out into the room and, and try to convince everyone to have a different emotion or to have, you know, to, to take advantage of psychology because we're so imperfect at measuring that. Right. On the other hand, if, if you think about your business as a system, right, it, it's, it's, that's, that's a little bit of the math side, but it's not quite the math side. You can even start to break down, you know, 
what is, you can, you at least have some mental models, I should say, to think about non-mathematical things. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we're talking about brand, right? Brand feels like one of the least measurable things in your business. And in a lot of ways, it absolutely is. It's, it's kind of you know, one of those things where you kind of know it when you see it and it's kind of good. But if we have a mental model of what brand is, hey, it's, it's having as many really good touch points as much as humanly possible that are, are great and, and provide a smile or provide um, reinforcement or provide whatever, and then reducing the number of not so great experiences. Now, all of a sudden, I have a system that doesn't really matter about what the psychology is, but I have a system to understand, cool, this person, you're going to do as many like touches as possible. And we're going to experiment with this thing that we can't really measure and this other thing that we can't really measure. But we know we're contributing to the system for brand. And so I, I, I think that's, that's kind of, it's, it's, not, it's not that these two schools of thought can't coexist. I just think the systems thinking is it's a lot more scalable because at the end of the day, the psychology and things like that of, of human beings, like everyone's so different. That's a lot harder harder to, to work on the individualized nature of a human than it is in the aggregate system of, of human beings coming together as an organization or as a community. Coming up, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and how it's going to affect business intelligence and what we should be looking for in the future. What's funny, and, and this is a good little tidbit, you know, speaking of psychology, is that right now, if you put AI, like artificial intelligence in your marketing copy, it actually increases willingness to pay of that user or that customer by about 10 to 15%. Uh, just, just putting it in there. It doesn't even have to be real, but there's just this allure with artificial intelligence right now because it's, it's kind of the hot new thing. And what's interesting is that it's, it's started to actually work in a lot of businesses. Um, so to kind of shift gears from you know, that little anecdote, I mean, we, we are using a lot of our data and artificial intelligence for our churn product retain to not only help out with delinquent churn, which is kind of the mechanical credit card failures, but to also help with voluntary churn, which is like active cancellations. And that's, that's one of those things where, you know, you need data to feed that model to essentially understand what works and what doesn't. And I think, we're not quite ready for it in the world of pricing. I think we're ready for it maybe in e-commerce, mainly because and there's folks who are already been using it in e-commerce, mainly because what happens in that world is basically you make a purchase and you know it's it's a really short sales cycle typically. In the world of kind of you know subscription X, Y, or Z or software, uh, a lot of times the sales cycle is a little bit too long. And so what ends up happening is you're sitting there and the price might change from day to day and the technology just isn't ready to, to properly cookie or properly identify someone and, and give them the right price. And so we're not far from it. Uh, it's going to affect business in a pretty big way, but that's mainly because the last, you know, 10, 15 years was really about tracking everything and then getting all of that data in, in kind of a, a somewhat clean or somewhat searchable space. And now probably the next 10 to 15 years is about, you know, how do we use that to, to make business intelligence actually intelligent, if that makes sense. What is a question that I should have asked you that we didn't talk about? Oh man, this is my favorite question to ask people. And now I am now in this position and I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer. Uh, I think it's probably, probably something around, I, I I think so, probably something around data, or at least this has been on my mind the last couple of days. So the, the question, so the official question, and I presume you want me to answer it, but uh, the, the, the question I think is around, you know, what, what makes data so hard to believe? And the reason I think that's an interesting question or something, some variant of it is, so we just published some data around NPS, uh, Net Promoter Score. And for, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of a measure of customer satisfaction. Uh, it's, it's one of those surveys, uh, or it's an aggregate number from the surveys that you probably have received that ask you, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, how likely are you to recommend the product to a friend or, or something like that? And it's, it's, it's a world that is very dogmatic, meaning... People who believe in NPS, they've staked their company on NPS. They're, it's just it's the Bible to them in certain places because it's useful for product, and it is it is actually very very useful in a lot of different ways. But we published some data that that kind of bucked a little bit of convention. Uh, basically, what we found is that NPS does not correlate directly to retention. Meaning, if you improve your NPS, there isn't a clear model by which you can say, "Oh, I'm going to." 
improve my retention if I'm improving my NPS. Now, definitely people who had very, very high like upper quartile NPS, their retention was also very, very good. But people who had average or above average or, or very, very below average NPS, they, they basically had the same retention. So what, it, what I'm trying to get at with that background is that all of a sudden we had published something that was very clean. Like I did the data science myself. Um, I'm not infallible, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this point about cleaning data and making sure we don't publish something that's, you know, kind of, uh, not great pseudoscience, but the number of people who, you know, wouldn't, didn't even read the full article, but started kind of raining, uh, criticism on the article and the data and things like that, where it was kind of shocking. And I think there's, there's something with us as human beings where, you know, we, we have strong opinions, but they're very strongly held. And I think that's a problem when it comes to data because data isn't perfect. Data isn't, you know, it's, there's never going to be a hundred percent certainty with any data, but at the end of the day, if, if, you know, you, you hold those opinions really, really strongly, then you end up making a mistake. And to tie that all the way back to, you know, building a company, deciding on the right market, you know, lowering your ego, you know, you have to be willing to look at data and considering both sides of, hey, maybe this data is completely right. And if so, what does that mean? Or maybe it's completely wrong. And if so, what does that mean? And I just, I think that people should be a little bit, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, kind of agreeable with that kind of a point rather than, hey, data is, uh, you know, data is wrong unless it proves my opinion. Yeah, that's a great point. That's yeah, a wonderful you know, way to, to summarize that. I realize I also didn't answer my actual question. <laughs> I, I think it's, but I think it's just because I think it does come back to ego. I think the reason we do this is because, you know, it, it, admitting you're wrong is very difficult. And it's, it's also one of those things where, you know, no one wants to be wrong. Right. And so to me, that's a big, uh, that's a big piece where if you can subvert that, that ego and be very open to being wrong, because you're going to be wrong hundreds of times in the trajectory of your business. So you might as well, you know, get, get semi used to it and, and not get emotional about it is I guess the way to look at it. Interesting. Well, Patrick, this has been a good call. It's been a great conversation to be able to learn um, what you guys are doing, uh, how you're applying technology to it and how you're solving the problem that will ultimately um, bring additional revenue to businesses. Um, to me, it's extremely interesting. And I think for our listeners, there's several nuggets in here. Um, you hit hard on looking at the data and then pulling our ego out of that data. Um, what would be the best, pe best way for people to get in touch with you? And then what's the first step so that they can start to apply some of these principles? I think the the best way to get a hold of me, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Patrick Campbell, um, or a PC at profitwell.com. Uh, I always get back to everybody. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than, than other times, but always get back to everyone at some point to help. I think the the big first step that I would recommend is is typically, I've found that when I give this advice or I actually do this myself, it works the best. And it really comes down to understanding what you want and what you want to get out of whatever experience you're having. Because if you want to build a you know, $100 billion company, uh, that's, that's a very different world that you're going to have to get used to and, and a very different mindset that you're going to have to get to versus, hey, I just want you know, 150 grand uh, you know, per year, which is definitely not easy. Don't get me wrong, but you, know, you don't have to worry about some of the things that we talked about. And so that's, that's the first thing I would, I would think about is like, what do you want to get out of your business? And, and what do you want to get on your role? What do you want to get out of you know, kind of your life? Which I know sounds really fluffy coming from a math guy, but I think once you have that figured out, then you can have as big of an ego or you know, as low of an ego that supports that mission or that vision. I'm assuming that probably the best first step of action for our listeners is to go to profitwell.com and to actually put things in place to start to get that dashboard and understand what's happening in the business. Would that be the first step? Yeah, absolutely. If you're a subscription business and you're using Stripe, Braintree, Zora, or Curly, Chargebee, or, or anything else, um, takes literally two to three minutes to set up and then you have access to all that data for, for your business. But yeah, it's a good place to start out because you get a little bit of truth. You understand where you're sitting and also understand uh, you know, where you're hurting as well. Well, thanks for spending time with us today. Um, also, thanks for you know giving us uh, uh, some insights that possibly many of our listeners here won't have. 
And uh, for all you listeners, again, go to profitwell.com and check out their site. It's beautiful, beautiful UI. If anything, just say, this is what the user experience should look like. And I'd probably hint that they have good data to make those decisions. And awesome. thank you for spending time with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I personally want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. As you know, with all of the other episodes, I'm not an affiliate, so I'm not getting a commission. I'm not rewarded for you to sign up or even listen to this episode. This is just me creating a community for all of us to learn. So here's what I would love for you to do. One, as we mentioned, uh, you can follow up Patrick and you know give a shout out. You can say thanks. We'll put his contact information inside the show notes. But also, if you could leave a review inside of iTunes and let others know what you think of this podcast, that's the best way for us to organically grow. Uh, you can share the episode on your social feeds if this is something you like. But please, you know, give a shout out to Patrick and thank him for taking the time to do this. And for me, as the host of this show, it's my sandbox to be able to provide more value to you as a listener and to help out. And I hope that you get the most out of it. Uh, Depending on what podcast platform you listen to, you can subscribe on iTunes, Google Podcasts, you can follow on Spotify, on Stitcher, wherever that may be. But I do sincerely want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. (laughs) 